Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining APQC's webinar, How Lincoln Financial Grew Employee Engagement in a Pandemic. As a reminder, audio is available through your computer speakers or dial-in lines, and all attendee lines are muted. This is the Q&A tool located on the right of your screen. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them here and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. Another feature is that you can raise your hand if you have a question and you would like to ask it aloud, and we will address all questions at the end of the presentation. As a reminder, you'll get the slides and the recording via email within a few days. And I would now like to pass the presentation off to the Human Capital Management Principal Research Lead, Alyssa Tucker. Well, welcome to our listeners and thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited about today's webinar. It addresses a topic that's really of strong concern uh, to APQC members um, this really over this past year in particular. Um, and that topic is employee well-being and, and engagement. Some of the questions that we've been hearing from our members include things such as, how can we make sure that our employees are coping with remote work? How much information do we share with our employees without overwhelming them? How can our managers uh, support employees? How do you engage workers at, at this particular time? What is next after COVID uh, in terms of how we manage and, and how we lead? And how do we support employees from an emotional standpoint as they're coming back? Uh, to the workplace. So today's webinar, we're going to hear about how Lincoln Financial has addressed employee well-being uh, and engagement in the pandemic, um, really by innovating in the area of employee listening. Um, what I think is particularly helpful about Lincoln Financial's journey uh, is the changes that they've made not only have addressed pandemic related challenges, but they've really also put into place a new way of approaching employee engagement that will endure well beyond uh, the pandemic. So it's my pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker, Kate Feather. Kate is the Vice President of Culture and Engagement at Lincoln Financial Group. She leads an enterprise-wide approach to employee engagement with the goal to strengthen the employee experience across all of Lincoln's uh, businesses and locations. She works towards creating and sustaining a culture and, and a work environment where employees across Lincoln feel motivated to give their best every day, feel supported by the organization's programs, believe they have a voice, and believe they are recognized for their contributions. Kate has more than 15 years of experience assessing and advising organizations on employee and customer experience design and delivery. Previously, she supported Lincoln's HR and business groups as a consultant around culture uh, and engagement. So welcome so much, Kate. Happy Thanks, to have Liz, you here today. To be, super to be here. Thank you. So let me um, get, get going here. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to take you on a journey. It's our journey over the last 12 months. And as, as we kind of finish up the conversation today, what I'm hoping you'll take away is uh, from all of this is sort of how we use the pandemic to accelerate our employee listening strategy, which is really a catalyst for culture, you know, supporting our culture. And as I go through, I'm going to kind of point out some critical success factors, things we learned along the way that made it a success. And then a big topic that is clearly part of our success, but I think it's worthy of its own um, uh, focus area is how we've harnessed the power of our managers to drive employee engagement. And finally, because we never want to just settle, I'll talk to you about what we're thinking about doing next. Uh, throughout the conversation, and I do believe this should be a conversation, even though I'm a talking head and um, yeah, you know on your screens, We'll be doing some polling just to keep people uh, connected to the dialogue. And it's also helpful for me to know what you all have been doing as we've been going through the last very bizarre 12 months. So before I get into the actual content, I thought it would be helpful to orient you all to who is Lincoln Financial, in case you're not familiar with our organization. We are a uh, financial services organization, been around since 1905. We're headquartered out of Radnor, Pennsylvania, but we do have um, a national footprint. We're in the US only, about 11,000 employees um, in total, 11,000 plus. Uh, and we have four main business lines and I sort of bifurcate them into uh, products and services that are in the works, uh, workplace solutions space. 
So what that means is that we support employers with offering their employees important benefits like short-term disability, dental, uh, and in our retirement plan services group, investing in 401ks and building, um, building wealth for the future. In the personal side, on the personal side of our business, we have two main uh, lines, which is around annuities, uh, so creating lifetime income after retirement, as well as life insurance. How can we protect our loved ones in the event of you know, an, an untimely death? Um, so that's our business. But what I think is really interesting is how we came to be and how that plays a part in the story I'm going to tell you. So we were, like I said, founded in 1905 by a series of, uh, by a group of uh, businessmen in Fort Wayne, Indiana, who wanted to do life insurance at the time, life insurance in an entirely different way. At that time, uh, back in 1905, uh, consumer trust in life insurance was at an all-time low. It was you know, particularly low. And they wanted to create a company that was founded on integrity, honesty, and trust. And so in doing that, they thought, well, who, who at that moment in time is the emblem of integrity? And it was Abe Lincoln. So they actually wrote to Abraham Lincoln's son, uh, Robert Todd Lincoln, and asked if they could use his name and his image and got permission. That was really a game changer in the marketplace, right? It allowed Lincoln to differentiate around um, integrity and trust. And we had taglines at the time, like um, its name indicates its character and we're as sound as the policies of Honest Abe. But over time, it's really become a differentiator for employees uh, because when you join Lincoln, you know you're joining a company that really does live and breathe integrity, respect, and care, uh, not just for our customers in the marketplace, but also for our employees. And I'm, I'll come back to that in a minute as I get into this, this journey, uh, this, the journey we went on. Um, but now let me just... Um, uh, You. Sorry. Um, so I will talk to you about how we went through this in um, 2020, but, but but I think it's helpful before I get ahead of my skis to think about um, where we came from. So I, jo I actually joined Lincoln in March of 2019. And at that point, we had a really robust employee listening strategy. We had been listening to employees from in terms of a full scale employee engagement survey ooh, um, for for you know, well over a decade. And um, that employee engagement survey really did feed a lot of the HR and talent strategy initiatives that we put into place over time. Um, so it was truly a part of the fabric of the company was the employee engagement data and what we did with it was, was real. From that, that was every other every other year, we would do these deep dive employee engagement surveys. In the in-between years, we would often do pulse surveys, either in a, in a specific business or across the whole enterprise to really like figure out is, is our action, are the actions we're taking making a difference or, we, or do we need to course correct? Um, we also frequently did and still do what we call deep dives, um, focused on a particular topic or a particular population um, to really, get more insights behind often things that we'd uncovered in the employee engagement survey. So for instance, we'll do a conjoint study on our total rewards design, which informs the decisions we make about total rewards uh, in the future. Or we'll do a deep dive on internal communications because we may have learned that that was an area that needed to be shored up. So uh, we had these three kind of approaches for creating um, insights to drive action around the employee experience. Now, when I came on board in 19, um, I'm a big believer, I'll just say this, I'm a big believer that nothing happens in an organization outside of a conversation, right? You, it, or to put it another way, everything that happens happens because of a conversation. And the, while we were listening to employees, and you could say that these were big conversations at big points in time, we weren't having a continuous conversation and it's pretty tough to have um, a conversation with 11,000 people on a continuous basis unless you use some sort of um, technology solution. So I proposed and my boss was all all in, you know, that we, we move into a continuous employee listening approach. But at the time, we got a fair amount of 
pushback from um, the business and from leaders in that, you know, won't this lead to over surveying uh, and survey fatigue? Will we really be able to take action on the feedback that we're getting? What would this do to productivity? Um, and so we were still in those debates when the pandemic hit. Um, and what I'd love to, to know, sorry, I'm moving too fast. Um, what I'd love to know from all of you uh, before I tell you what we did is when you think about 2020, um, uh, did the frequency with which you listen to your employees uh, increase? Did it go up? Did you keep it the same or did it decrease? And I'm going to give you a few minutes just to respond to that because I think it gives us a, a sense of uh, how similar everybody's experiences have been who are on the, who are on the call. And we just need a, cu a couple of minutes and then I'll talk to you about what we did. All right, so it looks to me, right, like about six in 10 of the audience increased the frequency. So you're, uh, we're in good company um, and, and very few uh, actually pulled back from listening. Um, so that's um, consistent with our experience as well. I think I need to move on. Um, there we go. So when March, hit last year, our CEO, Dennis Glass, came out almost immediately with a very clear message to employees across the enterprise, which was we were going to do three things. We were going to lead with protecting our people. We were going to take care of our customers, continue to take care of our customers. And we were going to do our best for Americans. And those three messages are really uh, part of the story that I'm going to tell you. And in particular, the, the first one, which for us in HR and for me and my role leading culture and engagement, it was like a guiding light, right? This was, so we have to protect our people. Well, you can't protect your people if you don't know what's on their minds, what they need, what they're worried about. Um, and so that was our opening to move into continuous listening. Um, so that's how it accelerated our strategy around listening to employees. So we launched a program called Feedback Fridays. It's like the name says, every Friday we invite feedback from everybody in the company um, on three questions. So it's really short, takes a minute. Um, two quantitative questions and one open end. Um, it's quick, it's topical, so the questions are not necessarily the kinds of things that you would be asking about on an engagement survey. It's very much related to what's happening right now. Um, you know, uh, attitudes towards vaccines, for instance, would be an example of something that we, we have recently asked. Um, and uh, it's a continuous conversation that requires us to respond so that we can show that the feedback is valued and it's influencing our decisions. So when we first pitched this, we said, look, let's do it for five weeks because you know, because of the, the resistance we had experienced, like any other you know, sensible leader, was this is this a is is this something that we should be doing? Um, given you know the pressure it could put on the organization, perfectly good, solid um, leadership questions. But so we said, well, let's let's just do a five-week pilot. We'll listen, we'll respond, and then in the fifth week, we'll assess, um, assess success. So um, over the well, the sensitive, sorry. Um, over the five weeks, we started with um, questions about productivity, right? So everybody went home, you know, almost overnight, right? And and the question was, well, are people um, able to get their work done? Do they feel that they have what they need to be productive? And so those were the questions that we were asking in that first week. And a lot of what we were hearing back were things like office supplies. How do I make sure I have my pens and um, post-it notes and things that I that I used to use all the time? How can I ensure that I can get those now that I am in my home office? Um, and then and then it sort of also we uncovered a need for office ergonomics, right? So we had a lot of people who were sitting on, you know, uh, deck chairs um, or uh, at the kitchen table, which was not necessarily the best environment for their for their comfort. 
So from that, we responded with um, updated equipment ordering policies. We have an ergonomic assessment that people can take in order to see, you know, what do you what do you really need? How is your office set up? And then if you need to order a chair or a desk, that's part of the policy. And then our colleagues created like a B Lincoln at home toolkit to help people be really effective at home because there were a lot of questions about like what what collaboration tools should we be using? Do we put our video on or is that going to set suck up bandwidth? I mean, this is a year ago and these topics have all been, you know, addressed and put to the side. Um, week two, we moved into communication needs. So as we, you know, you're far from your, your manager now, um, what do you need to feel connected um, and what works best to ensure that you're still connected? And what we heard was really a need for higher touch leadership. And I'll get into this in a second, um, some increasing anxiety about the virus and what it means to people at work. Um, so we, our leaders stepped up and they became really adept at delivering short, authentic videos about what was going on, not only in the business, but also what was going on for them personally and how they were dealing with this. Because um, it was important to kind of understand that we're, you know, the, the human side of our leaders, and that came out really, um, really loud and clear in those videos. We did more town halls, more email updates, and then in response to the increasing anxiety piece that we were hearing, which were things like, listen, I'm a, I'm a parent or I'm a caregiver, I'm full-time working from home, my kids or the people that I'm responsible for um, are full-time here as well, or what happens if I get sick, what happens if an elderly relative gets sick? All of these questions were coming up and we didn't have a response at that point, um, you know, a couple of weeks into the pandemic. So what we did is um, we actually have like a, a COVID policy team established early on um, and they developed an emergency leave policy that allowed at that time, um, and we've since increased it, employees to take 80 hours of paid time off in, in the event that they're affected by COVID in any one of those ways. Um, moving from that, we, we asked about people's usage of our benefits and what they needed. Um, you know, we had uh, waived co-pays on telemedicine visits. Um, we were just worried about people avoiding the doctor if they needed to go and also making sure that they really understood the full scope of the benefits that we had on offer. Um, for instance, our EAP, our Employee Assistance Program, has a homework um, advisor, like a, a homework connection, so you can have tutoring uh, for your kids uh, free of charge. But a lot of people didn't know about that because they hadn't needed it before. Um, so we uncovered all of that, held a, a benefits town hall, first of its kind, and had tremendous attendance. We had two of them, and you know, people um, people showed up and really um, learned and built awareness. And actually, in our employee engagement survey in September, we discovered really increased positive perceptions of our benefits and it's largely because people have had to you know use them and educate themselves because of the need um, we also launched our communications colleagues launched some moments that matter videos over the proceed the following months that sort of had real stories from employees talking about when they've used a, a lincoln benefit at this time um, so we built sort of a, a clarity and understanding around that the fourth uh, topic was actually about paid time off. Um, we were, like many organizations, I imagine, discovering that people were avoiding paid time off. Um, and that was not good for burnout and stress. Um, and it was not good, quite frankly, when, you know, when you're carrying those hours on the books. Um, so we wanted to help understand why people were avoiding it, how we could help them to really decompress and take care of themselves. Um, and avoid that burnout that we were seeing. Um, so from that, we curated a lot of information about travel because people didn't know like, where can I go and is it safe? And um, we really communicated directly to managers to suggest that they, they support their employees in scheduling time off. And even if it's just a staycation, just to decompress. Um, and one of the things I was most proud of was that we, you know, people wanted to increase carryover. We didn't think that was a good idea um, for the financial reasons that I referenced, but also people were burning out um, and we didn't want to have that be uh, something that we supported 
by communicating that, okay, well, don't take your PTO and you can take an extra two weeks over into 21. Um, so we had a very honest, direct communication go out to all employees explaining that while we were hearing people wanted to increase carryover, we weren't going to, and here were the reasons. And we got great response to that um, because of just how, how transparent we were being. So week five, we asked about the future of Feedback Fridays. Um, do you think we should continue this? And um, when, we, when we looked at, at our success at that point in time, that survey helped, right? So we saw that about uh, three and four said, yes, keep going. This is so critical to who we are, to us feeling cared for, supported, heard. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the people who were neutral were like, well, you don't need to do it weekly. Um, but don't stop. The other thing is that when we looked at response rates um, over time, we had, and I hadn't talked about this, so this was a Friday survey, we closed it on a Monday, but we communicated that it was only open on Fridays. Um, at the beginning, we had about 40%, week one, 40% of people participating. By week five, and it's continued, we had 50, 52%. So we are continually getting um, one in two employees to participate in a matter of a day um, on a weekly basis. Um, and then this is just an example of what people said, you know, this is great. I really, really feel that um, I'm heard and supported, don't stop. So that was um, perfect. Uh, evidence that this was actually a success. And so we moved on and continued with Feedback Fridays um, beyond the pilot. Um, and, and what I'll say here, I'm not gonna go into all of the things that we did as a result, but if you think about where we began, we were very much at the bottom of the hierarchy of needs, right? We were looking at kind of, um, you know, kind of uh, shelter and safety type stuff, right? Like, am I going to hurt my, my neck, my back, my wrist as, as I'm working from home? Or how do I ensure that I have the, the tools and equipment that I need? And as we started to listen, it became much more higher up the hierarchy of needs, um, things around, um, you know, sense of, of belonging and inclusion. And that became particularly true uh, in the summer after the, the murder of George Floyd. Um, and we used Feedback Fridays in addition to just our, our leadership around diversity, equity and inclusion and our commitment to it that's been around for, for um, well over a decade. For, and, and like I said, it's kind of part of who we are in terms of our, our, our roots. Um, but we, we, um, we started a series of crucial conversations, one of the beginning of which was using our EAP uh, counselors we almost, um, our benefits folks looked at it like, like if there had been a death, uh, like we would if there was a death of a colleague, a beloved colleague, and it was sort of come in and try to, um, you know, have uh, real conversations about how people are feeling at this moment in time. So we had a, you know, a qualified counselor be part of those conversations. And then that expanded to conversations with leadership and their teams, um, real honest conversations about, uh, racial justice and, and inequity. Um, and, you know, that, that was very much fueled by things that we were hearing through, through, the, uh, through the feedback. Um, we expanded emergency leave because we heard people saying that, you know, they, they uh, were continuing to feel that anxiety. So we went from 80 hours to 240 hours of paid time off in, in you know, the, the circumstances that I described before. And Parents and caregivers were a huge source of concern for us, um, and I'm sure many of you find that too. Um, so we've, we've started to roll out more resources to help parents and caregivers. Affinity groups are coming down the pike, and we also found that social isolation, so, so that sort of sense of connection with colleagues and friends at work, was falling by the wayside a little bit. So we've introduced, or we're, we're introducing a pilot uh, shortly, where which we're calling common room and it's an opportunity to join a group or series of groups on topics that are of interest to you including the ability to network with people outside of your area and keep those relationships front and center so so there's a a, a lot of listening and response that continues as we um, advance with feedback fridays um, 
So one thing I'd love to know, you know, we had we heard a lot, right? Like I've talked about, we had burnout, we had uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, a lot of issues around health and safety, concerns around productivity. As you think about what was most concerning people issue, and I know it's hard to choose one, but maybe, you know, um, top of mind, what do you think was the most concerning pe people issue for your organization's leaders in 2020? So is it burnout, uh, DE&I, health and safety, productivity, or, or something else? All right. Yes, health and safety, uh, followed by productivity. Um, and that, yeah, so I mean, and that's kind of where we started, I think. And then as we as we advanced with the conversation, we, we started to focus more on these burnout issues. One of the things that we identified was um, a concern over our increasing meeting culture and the, um, the bleeding of the commute time into work time. And so in 2021, we've actually um, created from the, from the top a message around protect your lunch hours, protect Friday afternoons for focus time and schedule meetings to be 25 and 50 minutes in length wherever you can uh, to give people that time for you know, a breather in between. So, I think that one of our critical success factors here and how we've maintained momentum, uh, participation, engagement in Feedback Fridays is this closing the loop aspect. And the way we've done that is in really three parts, I would say. Uh, the first is that our CEO and his direct reports view this data in a one-page dashboard every week. So as we were, and I'll, I'll be on, uh, in 2021, we're not doing it weekly um, because we heard that feedback, which I'll, you know, we heard that actually in the employee engagement survey in September. Um, so as and when these dashboards are produced, our executives are reviewing them and understanding what's going on and then sharing that with their senior leadership team so that there's a true understanding at the most senior levels of the, the, the challenges and the way that we should be responding. We also use our, uh, there's a channel specifically for people managers and we do communicate directly with people managers about things we're hearing so that they are also aware. Um, and then we ensure that employees are aware of what's happening partly through our leader videos. So our leaders do talk about, you know, in Feedback Fridays, you told us this, this is our response, uh, which is very effective. Um, but we also have recently launched a channel that's specifically about closing the loop on employee feedback. So that's where you go to find out what, have, what did you learn from this last Feedback Friday or from the employee engagement survey or from any other listening post and what is the enterprise doing about it? So critical success factor, obviously closing the loop, but it starts with leadership oversight and interest in what's being said. And I think because we had that um, guiding light in our CEO's statement up front that we're going to lead with protecting our people. I think that gave us a really big opportunity to, to do this. Uh, so our, our current employee listening strategy now has four elements, right? We have the biannual employee engagement survey, we have our pulse checks, we have our deep dives, and we clearly have this continuous listening, which following the five-week pilot became it became obvious that this was a um, an indicator of our culture and how much we care about employees and taking it away was not um, at all on the table. Uh, we couldn't possibly do that partly because people supported it um, or largely because people supported it, but also it shows it, it's a it's a, a symbolic of how much we care about having a conversation with our employees, even if it's done through this technology. So September was the um, biannual date for us to do our deep dive employee engagement survey in 2020. And we went right ahead and, and did that um, to update our priorities, inform our HR and talent strategy, 
and assess you know where things stood from broader perspective beyond the topical that we've been exploring and uh what i think is um uh one of the things we're most proud of is in the past we had engaged employees in the idea of the survey and in participating through a lot of high touch in-person efforts so we always had road shows and we would have our senior leaders go visit all of the sites and talk about the importance of the engagement survey and how we've used the feedback and we would have posters and tent cards and giveaways it was all very much um sort of you know face-to-face -face, leader to employee driven and we couldn't do that in 2020 obviously so we had to get kind of agile and kind of creative and i'm so proud because the campaign that we came up with and the tentacles that came from that um well one it, it won an award so our creative team just you know were phenomenal um but 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 two it led to better results than we'd ever seen in terms of participation so what it was was we came up with this um give us your two cents right so lincoln is on the penny um your two cents is your opinion um but we tied it to the third prong in dennis glass's statement up front which was um doing what we can for americans so we have a very strong foundation that had been um, um giving to feeding america to help with the those who were you know the food insecure um which was a growing problem as we all know so what we what we did is we said well if you if you give us your two cents it's going to add up to a lot of change a lot of change being what we'll do in the organization on based on your ideas but also for every employee who posts on our channel that they gave their two cents with their picture of their postcard we will donate to feeding america and we had tremendous response because it was so tied to who we are as an organization and the purpose um, and uh, <clears throat> you know, it just it it just led to great followership. Um, and when I talk about the kind of how we close the loop with employees now, the channel that we have um, on our uh, social, um, so it's so our mobile intranet, is uh, called Your Two Cents at Work. So how we're putting your two cents to work. Um, and so um, the the results were phenomenal we had a 95 percent participation rate across our 11,000 plus employees in the employee engagement survey beat any prior records beat our um partner perceptics uh we work with perceptics on this um uh you know they'd never seen like where maybe uh with the top four percent of companies in terms of participation our most employees 91 percent said they felt supported throughout covid um and taking care you know adapting and adjusting to the changes that were coming because of covid and i think that was um really uh indicative of how successful our listening efforts have been and our and our response more importantly and we had really strong scores around our managers where in the past maybe it hadn't been as robust but because we've been engaging our managers and i'm going to talk about that in a minute um and and having them understand their the importance of their role now that people were remote um it really helped to um strengthen the uh, connection and the scores around individual managers and lastly we had just some tremendous pride in lincoln and i think that's a lot of that is driven by how we showed up for americans as well as for our customers and our employees uh so i'm going to talk about how we used our managers in a sec but i'd love to know from you all um does your organization currently give managers at all levels in the organization access to employee engagement survey results so do you go all the way down to all people managers do you keep it at a different level and it's just a simple yes no or you don't know and give it a couple a couple seconds here, see where, where you guys are landing. All right, close to half um, of you are giving access to your all people managers, which is fabulous because I think that is democratizing feedback is one of the critical success factors that we've identified this year. 
Um, and, uh, and hopefully for those of you who aren't doing that yet, maybe some of this will help you to, to make that pitch. Um, so how have we, you know, we're looking at like maintaining momentum. We've got, oh, I didn't say, I should have said, we, we grew engagement. The actual score of engagement increased five points. And we use a very stringent measure to assess engagement that requires people to agree or strongly agree that they would stay with us, that they recommend us, that they get a sense of accomplishment from being here and doing their work and that they're proud. Um, and we saw a five point uptick, which was significantly higher than, you know, comparator benchmarks. Um, and in some of our groups, we had like 21 point increase. So uh, real, real movement on the outcome of engagement. Um, so we need to maintain this, right? We can't have any slippage, particularly as we think about return to work and what does that mean? And, you know, if we're considering hybrid models, which a lot of organizations are talking about, how do you ensure that you continue to engage and connect with people when there is no longer this level playing field um, that we all have when we're on, when we're a little square on a screen and everybody's the same square. Um, so we think about maintaining momentum in three ways, uh, three levers that we're pulling. One is manager know-how. One is, one is manager accountability. And the last is actually using social norms. So people I admire, people like me doing things that, hey, I could do that too. Um, so I'll talk to you about each of those as we go through. So know-how. We give access to the engagement area, you know, spoiler alert, um, to all people managers. So we have 1600 plus people managers. Every one of them got trained on the system that has that houses the data and they all got access to, you know, log in and view the information. If they had five or more direct reports responding, they saw their own data, which was a, a dip from, we used to be a lot more conservative about that. Um, and then if you had fewer than five, you saw the data for your manager above you, because even if it's not your data, you should be, and you're going to get bored of me saying this, you should be having a conversation with your team about engagement. So even if it's not your data, it's the data for your manager getting together with that small team and saying, this is what the, the big group is saying, what matters to our engagement? How can I help drive our engagement was something that we were coaching everybody on doing. But we wanted to make it simple, right? So we have a lot of player coach managers across Lincoln. Um, these are, you know, folks who who are doing and and leading and managing. Um, and so we couldn't ask them to do, you know, too much. And quite frankly, I truly believe that you need to just do one thing to see a catalyst for change in many other areas. So we said, choose one team priority based on a conversation. So the results were, we did the survey in uh, towards middle to end of September. Managers were trained on the system in October. We really, really quick turnaround. Um, and then we said, make sure you have a conversation about those results before year end. And in that conversation, identify the one priority for your team. Um, so that was a leader and team conversation, review the results, one priority. By today, um, have two actions documented in the system. Um, in, and so the system has an action planning tool. And so every manager needs to go in and say, this is my, my focus area here, two things I'm gonna do. And in the system, you can schedule three conversations throughout the year. Um, I'm pleased to say, I think we're like up to nearly 70% of actions documented in the system, um, which includes those scheduling those those conversations so that it's not just a one and done. Um, so accountability, um, how do we get people to, to go in and do this is really driven by oversight. We create dashboards for every senior leader that says this is where your action plans are at how you compare to the enterprise your little friendly competition never goes along but it never hurts and can go a long way um, and um, we also show the top um, the top areas of focus for the enterprise and then for that business area and that's really important because we don't want to just say like are we being compliant and creating an action plan but are we actually um, ensuring that uh, 
people know what's critical to their populations, what are their managers working on, and how can we from the center, from the culture and engagement team and our other colleagues in talent and total rewards and, and the like, support managers in making a difference and moving the needle. So that's one thing is these quarterly uh, dashboards to assess progress. But the other is um, that we are planning, and we've made this very clear, a pulse check in September that will be very simple. It'll be, did you hear about the results from your manager? Did you um, hear about the action plan? And have you uh, had conversations since about progress on that action plan? And are you seeing um, change? Are you seeing things get better? Um, uh, so, so that's how we're driving accountability, but we can't drive accountability without having given them the know-how. So we gave them this, this process, this training, you know, tools, resources, workbooks, videos. I mean, they've got everything that they need to know how to do this. And then it's about holding them accountable. And then the final lever, which I think is really important is, is the social norms piece, which is, um, we have done a series of interviews with some of our leaders who have got the highest scores in the engagement survey um, and have them sort of share their best practices. How do you create engagement? How do you maintain engagement? And showcasing some of those leaders at every level. So I'm, I'm, this is not just our corporate leadership group, which is our top 80 leaders in the company. This is, you know, a dental claims manager who just has a really good way of creating a sense of purpose for her uh, direct reports. Um, we we highlight these stories, and I think that goes. Um, it just helps people say, like, okay, this isn't this isn't rocket science, um, and I can I can do that too, and it could be effective for my team. We also this year, and I, I credit this team of 43 leaders across the company as having been a big part of our success with participation and quite frankly with the action planning. We have 43 engagement ambassadors across the business who are meeting with managers on a regular basis, sharing information about what's happening, what the expectations are, answering questions, bringing them back to the culture and engagement team. Um, and they are really driving, you know, driving participation from our managers and helping them understand like this is this will help you be more successful right like it's not just a, a like i said a tick the box exercise but this can truly drive your success as a manager because nobody wants that revolving door it's a it's a nightmare to try and get people up to speed um, and you may as well have a very stable fully functioning team um, that's a lot of the, an engagement focusing on engagement is a big way to do that um, we also held for the first time ever an all manager town hall so we brought everybody all 1600 were invited to virtual <laughs> to to join a conversation and a panel with some of these engaging leaders around what they do and and and, and, and why this matters and i think just that sense of inclusion that you are a leader in the business even if you're a brand new manager your supervisor in the call center you you play a huge role in being the 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 catalyst for you know you're you're carrying our culture and you're ensuring that we're driving engagement and supporting engagement and so we we you know we we wanted them to know that that role was really important and that we that it was valued um and that was also part of a little bit of part of the um the, the know-how piece but in social norms you know you're seeing people again people that you could that could be you on that stage that virtual stage talking about what you do that makes it such a success and then friendly competition always helps, right? Um, so, uh, getting close to the end here, I'd like to just share with you briefly where we think we're going next. Um, so there's no question that Feedback Fridays is part of our organizational culture now. It's part of how we do business. Um, it's, it's critical to people feeling supported, heard, cared for, and quite frankly, it drives a lot of the actions that we're taking within the HR organization. But we think we have a, an opportunity to go uh, more, um, uh, go, go kind of horizontally across the employee life cycle. So like many organizations, you know, we have, we do do onboarding surveys, we do exit surveys and we have this engagement and the pulses and everything but we we think there's a way for us to say how can we connect to each of those so we can become more um, predictive in our analytics in understanding what's happening at this point in time as somebody is onboarded 
can actually have an impact on their engagement level at point two and their retention at point three, you know, and, and it just kind of sort of looking at that holistic view of the employee life cycle. And it, it starts with being very intentional about what that employee experience should be. Um, and then focusing on the moments that really matter to delivering that employee experience. And we bar we're borrowing this from, I've done a lot of work in my prior life on customer experience design, and it's truly borrowing that and putting it into the, uh, into the internal experience, the internal customer experience. And so finally, as I think about what we've learned from this, and hopefully this came across as we talked about this, Connecting to the vision allowed us to create alignment around this change, right? So that, you know, lead with protecting our people. We could say, well, we can't do that if we don't start a conversation and know what they need to feel protected. So that was one thing is being able to, you know, connect to the vision and quite frankly, the two cents campaign and connecting to that bigger purpose around protecting Americans and doing our best for Americans was, was a big part of that too. Um, Obviously, it goes without saying, you've got to close the loop to fuel trust, even if closing a loop t means telling people something they didn't want to hear, like we did with the PTO. It was okay, um, because they, they felt heard and they understood the rationale, and it was about, you know, mutual trust and respect for each other's opinions. Um, and so, closing the loop fuels trust. Um, aligning to the bigger purpose, I, I think I just said that uh, in, a, in a different way, but, you know, so the Feeding America thing really drove participation for us um, because people could see that their two cents added up to a lot of change, not just within Lincoln, but elsewhere. Um, building know-how and accountability for local action and response is going to be your biggest opportunity for making real meaningful change and engagement because how people feel is very much driven by their local experience and the relationship with their manager. Um, and whether or not they believe that the organization is committed to engagement, ensuring that they feel um, that they are, you know, that they're motivated, that we want them here, that they belong, all of that is very much driven by the local experience. So you've got to fuel that kind of connection um, and, and use, use your managers to make that happen. And then, like, if you didn't hear this, I'm just underlining it one more time that nothing is going to happen in an organization, in a team, in a marriage, <laughs> outside of a conversation. So you've got to start that conversation, however it's going to work for your organization, in order to grow engagement in a pandemic or at any time. So with that, I think we'll open up for some, some questions. Wonderful, great. Thank you so much, Kate. That was a really engaging presentation. Um, what I, I love about uh, your story is just what a holistic approach you took and how everything that you did reinforced um, the ultimate goal. Um, so just really hearing you talk about it in that way, I think is very helpful and, and illustrates, you know, why you had such success, um, all the different levers that that were involved. So thank you for, for sharing yeah. your journey and your story. And I'd like to um, ask our uh, listeners to please, if you uh, haven't already, go ahead and submit your questions. Uh, and I'll be happy to facilitate some Q&A um, with Kate and just, you know, already Kate's just positive feedback and, and thank yous from the listeners for, for sharing your, th your story and, and sharing your strategy at, at Lincoln. So um, yes, you know, I echo that. Thank you so much. <laughs> and while we wait, you know, to see if we have any questions from the listeners, I did have a few questions that I wanted to ask for from you. Um, you know, you, you talked about how you got leadership buy-in to do the Feedback Friday surveys and the pilot that you did. For companies, people who work in companies who maybe aren't so receptive, um, didn't have those three pillars or prongs that you talked about your leadership having uh, to kind of tap into, do you have any advice? If you're someone dealing with leadership that's more skeptical um, about this, um, any suggestions for how to kind of start moving things in this direction? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I am always certain that there is a spectrum of support in the business and you will have somebody somebody in the business who says yeah I, I like this idea I want to do this I am you know at heart an engaging leader and I want to have a, a deeper connection with my employees so if you can find that group um, pilot prove success 
and then it and then generally it kind of you know um, um, snowballs from there. Uh, so I would I would say look for an advocate, somebody who's willing to to trial it, even in a small group, and just see how how that uh, how that works. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So I have a, a listener question. Uh, the question is, how can HR approach the topic of trust uh, when talking to executive management and to board members? And, and this listener comments that lately HR um, has been asked to leave leave certain conversations. So how can we as HR build our own trust with management? Um, so how does HR, I guess, build trust in the organization? So basically, how do you prove your value? I guess that's what we're saying is, is, is it how do you get leadership to see that you have value and you should be at the table? Yeah, I, I think that that is, I I it is a great interpretation, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so we started, and I'm talking a long time ago, with the conversation or with the, with the um, analysis that said, uh, it, people make a difference to the business and proving it out. So sometimes you have to go back to the very beginning where I, I feel like that conversation has moved on in corporate America. But if you don't have that trust, you need to be able to demonstrate through data and facts that we did this thing and it had this outcome, this impact that we can tie to this important business objective. So speaking the language of the business is going to start, you know, you're going to start to build trust. Um, and, and you really have to like take on an advisory approach rather than uh, um, a transactional relationship. So it's very easy to think of HR as being employee relations, um, you know, and dealing with the dealing with the nuts and bolts of HR. Um, but but we have a huge part to play and quite frankly for our profession uh, to prove that the work that we do does make a difference to the business through through retention you know what's the cost of attrition um, in certain roles how long does it take you to onboard people can you cut down the time for onboarding can you prove the link between employee engagement and customer NPS scores um, there's a, a whole host of ways you can look at this depending upon your industry to start to to tell the business case for what HR does. I hope that helps. I think it does. And that listener did write back in to clarify. And I think you're right on with what they were talking about. They're just saying that, you know, with employees, HR in their organization has the trust, but it's really with the board and executives that they're still having to prove themselves. And I think that's great advice, you know, talking the language that the executives and the, the boards talks in and, and prove prove out those those linkages that you just talked talked about um yeah. Yeah. yeah like for instance just to follow up on that like the um the big concern right at the beginning of the pandemic was around productivity and we i mean I'll, i didn't hear this but so this is my own words but i think a lot of people were like well what are people going to be doing when they're at home are they going to be you know putting in a load of laundry or going for a you know a nice long walk in the woods or something and and you know I think that if you can show that you're able to, through what you're doing, ensure productivity, like you speak their language, they're worried about productivity, are they worried about diversity and inclusion and ensuring that they have, you know, a good um, diverse group of people to drive innovation in the organization, because innovation is a buzzword, like listen for what matters and then think about how you can connect what you do to what matters to those business leaders. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I had a, just another question for you. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how much it costs to to start doing listening more continuously? Um, just looking even at Feedback Fridays, is this something that um, someone considering doing more than just an annual employee survey, adding more of this listening, is this a huge expenditure um, for them? You know, what was it like for you? No. It wasn't. Now we have a relationship. I mentioned Perceptics, who are, you know, uh, a great partner to us. We have a relationship with Perceptics on our employee engagement and pulse surveys. They had a simple self-service tool, and I, I mean, you could use SurveyMonkey if that's what you have in your system, in your organization, or Qualtrics, or whoever you're working with. But they had a simple self-service tool. So we we do this from inside the company. Um, and the and it comes with you know dashboards and analytical tools, so it's not a big lift. 
the hardest thing is making sure that you're, you know, you understand the topics that are on people's minds and that you're crafting the questions to get at the answers that you need. But um, honestly, if you have those skills, it's not even that difficult. So, and, and it was not expensive. I'm telling you, like, um, probably anybody, would, you know, like it's, it's, it wasn't a big deal. I don't remember the exact amount, but it was, yeah. Yeah. And you certainly, you've talked about so many benefits that the organization has reaped from this. So, you know, certainly whatever investment you've had to make really has, you know, really paid yeah, off. Yeah. Dividends. Yeah. 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 Um, so I just have one final question for you and, and it was really about um, managers, the manager piece, because I thought that is such an integral piece uh, of what makes, um, what closes that feedback loop and some, I think that's an area that um, not every company is able to, to make that leap um, towards closing the feedback loop and involving managers and leadership to the extent that, that you have. So what kind of feedback have you heard from managers um, so far? Um, extremely positive about, so that town hall that I mentioned that we kicked off like maybe last September was the first, was the first one we did. People were like so delighted to be part of, um, part of that community where, you know, if you think if your company is at all hierarchical, even if you're, you know, there's, there are levels and sometimes you feel like you're not part of those conversations or included or seen to be a leader, even though you have leadership expectations responsibilities right so that got huge uh hugely positive feedback and then honestly the training um the that we gave managers on how to get into the system how to have a good conversation like we, we didn't just say like here's how to use the technology it was like how do you have a conversation and what do you do if you're not comfortable with those results so they were developing right we were developing them as part of this so there was a very strong um benefit to them as leaders Okay, great. Yeah, it's so important to do those those steps. Um, I just have one more um, thing from listeners, so I'm just gonna read it real quickly. Um, it says, when it comes to feedback um, from managers, uh, when sharing engagements results, um, yeah, is there a natural fear for, on managers' part of receiving bad feedback? Um, and yeah. is that maybe why some companies don't share uh, the results of their surveys more broadly? Um, is that that fear of the negative feedback? And how have you dealt with that? Yeah. Um, absolutely. And everybody's going to be on a spectrum. What we say is, and it sounds cheesy, but it's true. Feedback is a gift. And this is not about what you did before. It's what you're going to do next. Um, so okay. use it to use it to get better. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that's great advice. It's about what you do next. Um, well, thank you so much. We're, we're pretty much at time, but thank you for, for sharing your story. Um, really appreciate it. And listeners, you'll be getting a copy of the slides and the, the recording uh, in a follow-up email. And uh, just thank you, Kate. And I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Madison, who's got some, some slides to close us out today. Thank you, Kate. That was a great presentation. And I just would like to remind everyone that you will receive a copy of the recording from today's presentation within a few days, as well as the slides. And we've attached some additional resources from our resource library. If you haven't checked out, they relate to growing employee engagement. And I've provided Alyssa's contact information. If you have any questions for APQC or any additional questions for Kate, um, please reach out to us and we'll get those answered and get back to you quickly. And if you haven't checked out our check out our employee um, human capital management expertise page, it provides the latest um, updates with within our research in the HR function. And if you haven't already connected with us on social. And thank you for joining. I hope you have a great day. Thank you again, Kate.